the thing is, to get grant money, right, to get grant money from the government or another body or whatever it is, you have to pretend you know where you're going, right? That's like the big sort of science's biggest trick is mm. you got to pretend, oh, give us this money and we'll go here. We'll get this new thing and that will be excellent. But a lot of the time you have no idea. Mm. You're just like, oh, shit, how do we get from here to, oh, I don't know, just, just, we'll put in that it's, you know, some preliminary results to show we can kind of go that way. But, um, there's nothing more exhilarating than not knowing where you're going, but equally, it's nothing more scary. And that's what I'm finding out about like, on my business journey right now is, I don't know where it's going, but good things always happen. Yeah. You've just got to lean into them. Yeah, so how do you lean into that exhilaration and the fear at the same time? This is Reignited, where together we will meet interesting people who have a curious message for the world. They'll tell us about their experiences so that we can all reignite our lives. Hi, welcome everyone. We're here at the pod at the pod booth, ready to talk to Andy Stapleton, who is a science communicator. So today we'll be talking all about science and what drives him and his entrepreneurial journey. So welcome, Andy. That is an absolute pleasure to be here. I get everyone when they begin our podcast, yeah. uh, to choose some symbols to mm -hmm. introduce themselves. So what have you chosen and why have you chosen them? All right. I had, I had a load of fun going through those. I was like waiting for the ones that would pop out and be like, yes, that's I, that, I, I'm attracted to that one. Um, so the first one is a question mark, um, mainly because I think like when I got into science, I just loved solving problems. And so just the act of learning through solving problems and doing was super important, super fun. Like that's the thing I really loved. So yeah, question mark for number one. Yeah, so that sense of answering questions and being really curious and seeing what happens. Yeah, curiosity, I guess. And I tell you what, like now that I've left science as a researcher and now that I'm growing my own businesses, um, it is the same thing. It's like you find a problem and you come up with a question and you solve that problem. Like, so it's no different really. Uh, and so, yeah, I think like answering questions and curiosity has been the the one thread through what I'm doing at the moment. Brilliant. Second one. Yes. This, which is happy, sad. So there's two masks. Uh, one's got a happy expression. One's got a sad expression. Yeah, that's right. And so um, this is typically about like theater. But for me, I think it's about finding the happiness all the time like i saw that the happy one was above the sad one and so i was like that's kind of cool like you know there are moments to be sad but it's like trying to inject humor into nearly everything i do is what really drives me i'm like yeah just be yourself have fun um and yeah that's why i think i chose this one is because there is there has to be happiness that sits above everything and that's what i liked about that and adding that humor into your world absolutely yeah 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 cool and the last one Music. So one of my hobbies, so I, I guess I'll, when I was growing up, I, I was able to do two things well in school, science and music. So I was at this crossroads. I was like, what do I do? Do I do science as a career or do I go to music? And I loved music. I loved everything about it. I loved playing it. I, I dabbled in the piano. I was, I was drumming a lot. And I thought, oh, what, what should I do? And I decided rightly or wrongly, that I would do science as a career and I would only ever keep music as an absolute hobby, like non-monetized part of my life. And I'm really pleased I did that. So I'm part of community, a community samba band. So I founded a community samba band, which is a Brazilian style percussion group um, in 2012. And we're completely community focused. Anyone can join and we do performances at uh, charity events, community events. Also, we do corporate stuff now to bring in a bit of money. So, yeah, music has balanced out the science aspect. And I'm so pleased I kept it as a hobby and a non-monetized part of my life. Yeah, wow. So your life could have gone in two directions, and but you've incorporated both into yeah, your Yeah, that's world. right. Yeah. But the good thing is both science and music have the equal amount of drug taking. So uh, I thought, okay. that, yeah, I think it's just great. That's what, what do you mean by drug taking? I mean, self-medication <laughs> <laughs> for sadness and fun and yep. all that sort of stuff. So yeah, why not? So they sort of sustain you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah the balance. The balance and is great. And what's the name of the band, just so people uh, believe they want to join? Sa Samba. S-A Samba. So South Australian Samba. 
Um, so Samba has been going th since 2012 and like I said, completely community focused. So anyone can join. I've been drumming since I was about 13 um, and everywhere I've been, I've been able to drum and include that as part of my life. And it's a great uh, social thing. I always like, why do people come every Thursday to practice, to play? Like I'm always like, why do they do that? Hmm. And it always comes down to community. Yeah. We, they love, like people get to come, they have a, a, a joint activity. And then in the middle, they chat and afterwards they chat and we meet up on the weekends before and after gigs. And like that community aspect is really important and something I think people seek and search for. So yeah, that's what we provide. So sasamba.com.au is our website. Awesome. And it just reminds me of in art therapy, we quite often talk about the body as well. So drumming has a real aspect that is physiological really good as well That's but right, also yeah. what's happening in the room and the synchronicity that happens with everyone together yeah absolutely yeah, yeah i completely agree and i think um I took about uh, six months off samba once and i came back to it and that's exactly what i noticed when i came back was that entering a room of people doing a common task and activity that's physical yes. is really it's yeah something special it's really nice yeah i even had a client yesterday who just got on the drums and away he went just yeah, needed nice. to release something so it's pretty cool good yeah yes. good so let's go back to why science. Mm. You know, what sort of drove you? You said when you're at school, yeah. Well, you like science. You like music. Yeah, yeah. This is this is going to show me up in the worst light possible. <laughs> My chemistry teacher, Doc, uh, no, Mr. John Trudgett was his name. He was a fantastic teacher, but also he told me how great I was at it. Oh, really? And he was like, you are so great at science. And I was like, mm, thank you. And I think it was completely <laughs> ego driven where it was like, um, I did enjoy science, no doubt. Like I enjoyed the process. Um, I enjoyed finding out new things and that curiosity component. Uh, but the fact that he was sort of inflating my ego and making me feel great about it, I was like, mm, this is definitely a feeling I want to continue. And uh, yeah, I think that that kind of like just pushed me towards the science career. And uh, I, it's weird. I took it the furthest I could go, you know, went to obviously did it in high school and then went to uni and then uh, PhD, which brought me to Australia. So uh, I did enjoy, you know, when people talk about why they like science, it's like, oh, I love finding out about the world and the majesty and the blah, blah, blah whatever, whatever. For me, there was a little bit of that. It was mainly ego that was driving me and, yeah. and I liked compliments. Yeah, and even that that sense of how a teacher can influence you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but also that affirmation and that, oh, I might be good at this because someone's mm. telling me that um, mm -hmm. and how that plays throughout. So nanotechnology yes. is what you did your PhD on. Yeah. Can you just explain to all of us who have no idea what that, uh, that means? Yeah, sure. You know, why that particular area and what did that do for you? So... When I was choosing what I wanted to do my PhD in, you know, you kind of have to take it a little bit seriously just because you're doing something for three years. And so I found a project at Newcastle University in Australia, um, and it was about solar paint. It was about creating a paint that, for example, you could paint on your roof and turn your whole roof into a solar panel. Um, that's where it was heading, but we had nothing, right? We had next to nothing to start. Um, and so I guess at that point is when I specialized in nanotechnology and it's called colloid and surface science, but essentially it's like paints and stuff. Uh, <laughs> so nanotechnology in, in kind of a nutshell, it deals with technology and uh, things that are in the nano scale. So that's like a hundred nanometers. And so you can fit, uh, I think it's like a hundred of these nanoparticles across the width of a human hair is where we start. So the nanoparticles I was working on, yeah, they were incredibly tiny. Um, and we turned those into a paint that you could paint on your roof. Um, and the research was featured in the ABC New Inventors. Remember that old program? Yeah. Where they'd sit there and, yeah. Uh, it's by, so my supervisor was Paul Dastor. And uh, yeah, he, he uh, had this project. I loved it. And so nanotechnology is what I fell into because I wanted to help solar cell technology. And the way we did that, yeah, was through these nanoparticle paints. So tiny, tiny particles in a paint. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, where, that's why I ended up in the nanotechnology uh, world. And how does that, that knowledge and that research inform 
what you do because it's quite an innovative sort of thing to focus on i would assume mm. so you mean how it affects me like how it's yeah affected like did me now what sort of happened in that process of of looking at that and what drives you now mm. so once i mean what i really liked about it is that at the time it was a really hot topic you know like solar technology and and that really drove me i was like wow i'm working towards a bigger purpose you know that that's really nice and also uh once again it makes you feel kind of clever when people are like, what are you working? I'm like, oh, nanotechnology stuff. <laughs> I'm so cool. So I'm so your ego again. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> this is all about ego. That's why I started the vlog. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so so that that really drove me during that time. But what continues to drive me through that is learning my way out of problems. I love coming up against a problem, even in business now, which is different problems, but still the same process where you come up against something and you're like, okay, I can learn stuff. That's my one weapon. I don't have much money. I can't chuck money at this problem to go away. But what I can do is learn new things very quickly and implement that so that I can get over this problem. And so, for example, I taught myself to code in about two months. I just did it. I did courses. I practiced. Uh, and then I built Verbalize.science web app. So that's, uh, yeah, my, my, my startup. Uh, and another thing like, okay, I need to sell to people. Now I need to sell. How do you sell? And so I did loads of reading and resource and like went through some courses on how to sell. And I was like, okay, that's great. Now, and I, now I've got customers. So that act of coming up against problems and learning something so you can overcome that problem, I think has been that common thread all the way from that nanotechnology days. Yeah. So that, that thing of that we constantly come up in, against challenges in life all the time. And mm. it's like, what do you do to to overcome them? And knowledge is power, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it, it kind of frustrates me when I speak to people. Like I come up a lot against entrepreneurs and, and want, want entrepreneurs. Have you heard that? Like people who like like love the idea of starting a business, um, but just, just can't get over the hump of the doing aspect. And um, yeah, for me just doing like being relentlessly sort of just active you know one percent better every day if i can do that for something whether it's my music or whether it's my businesses or whether it's just me personally like that's what i've got to do and i think when i'm faced with challenges it's like okay how do i how do i proactively get myself out of this i'm not one for sitting around and uh, complaining too much yeah, yeah. you got to complain yeah a little bit absolutely <laughs> yeah. and i find in in the sessions i do with people in art therapy I actually use the word let's be a curious scientist and just see what's cool. there. Um, and usually people come with problems. So it's yeah. actually the art helps us to solve that problem because it gives us information and knowledge. Yeah, well, um, there's a huge well. push. Like, I mean, about two years ago, there was this STEM to STEAM yes. where they included arts. And it's look, it divided the community because all of the old professors were like, oh, why would I want art in my, my perfect science? This is terrible. Uh, but absolutely, it's that curiosity, it's the creativity part of science that is brought out. And um, there's been a load of artist collaborations and it's just resulted in some magical things, you know, like, and also it's improved the curiosity of other people to science as well. Yes. So it's just multifaceted. Yeah, it's brilliant. So yeah, I'm so pleased that you use, let's be a curious scientist. Yeah. I'm going to use that now, even in my business. I'm oh, like, okay, yeah. <laughs> not this problem. Let's be a curious scientist and yeah. solve it. Yeah, and that thing of you don't have to know where you're you're ending up. It's no. it's about that process of finding out mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. Which I don't know. Do scientists do that? Uh, what well, don't know where they're going? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The thing is to get grant money, right? To get grant money from the government or another body or whatever it is, you have to pretend you know where you're going, right? That's like the big sort of scientist's biggest trick is mm. you got to pretend. Oh, give us this money and we'll go here we'll get this new thing and that will be excellent. But a lot of the time you have no idea. Mm. You're just like, oh shit, how do we get from here to, oh, I don't know, just, just, we'll put in that it's, you know, some preliminary results to show we can kind of go that way. But um, there's nothing more exhilarating than not knowing where you're going, but equally, it's nothing more scary. And that's what I'm finding out about like, on my business journey right now is, I don't know where it's going, but good things always happen yeah. and you've just got to lean into them. Yeah. So how do you lean into that exhilaration and the fear at the same time? Uh, I, I read something recently which really resonated with me. No, I went to a, a fringe performance, which really, there was this one moment in it. Uh, it was called The Gods, The Gods, The Gods. 
Uh, and I can't remember exactly, but the, the sentiment was uh, bravery isn't about overcoming fear. Like, uh, it's not about living without fear. It's about living with fear, but pushing through it. And I think that I was like, yes, that's what I like to do. Like, yes, it scares me. And I think um, a good friend of mine, Gareth, once said, this scares me, so I know I should do it. Yeah, that thing of really embracing that, yeah. because that's a part of our experiences. Mm. It's not just about, oh, this is easy, this is great, this is fun, this is everything. The fear mm. sits there to help us move forward. Yeah, and yeah. I, uh, as well with like public speaking, like I, I like public speaking, but still there's a fear. And I do have anxious mornings where I know I'm talking later that day and uh, anxiety is building and frame, reframing that as excitement is partly helpful, but also just acknowledging that it is fear mm. and leaning into it and being like, okay, this is going to make me a little bit sharper. This is going to help me, but I just need to get through it right now. Yeah. So trying to reframe it mm. so you can lean into it as yeah, you say. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So let's talk about verbalize.science. Yes. What, that's your business. Yeah. What does that involve? <clears throat> so uh, about three years ago, I left research. And I left research because I didn't like the culture that existed. I didn't like the hyper competitiveness, the fighting over scraps of money and just it became horrible anyway. And so I was like, right, I want to do something productive for science. What are my skills? And I always was able to stand out, not because I was an amazing scientist, but because I was, be I was able to communicate my ideas quite well. Hmm. Um, and so that led to like TEDx talks at Flinders Uni, which was fantastic, uh, which led to, you know, speaking at conferences, getting opportunities. And I thought my science, like my, the act of like the science I produced was no better or worse than anyone else's. But being able to communicate effectively is what I wanted to help other scientists do. Now, scientists do have a little bit of a stereotype where they're introverted, they're comfortable at the lab bench, but not speaking in front of people. And all that really existed in the market at the time was kind of like workshops. Come in, do our workshop, leave, tick a box, boom, you're now a communicator, right? There was no actual tool which enabled scientists to communicate almost like in the way they wanted, which was introverted. Mm. Okay. So, um, so what I did is I wanted to create an online uh, tool to help communicate science, bring scientists to the front of the conversation because I felt like there was a huge disconnect between the scientist in the lab and where the science was communicated and where it ended up. And so I thought, how do we bring these scientists out of the lab to the front of the science communication kind of push? And so the the web application we created essentially was guided by speaking to scientists and helping them communicate effectively. They wanted to do it quickly. Yep. They wanted all of the steps laid out. You know, these are incredibly clever people. I was going to say, science drives our world. Yeah. And, you know, it's a real shame if it stays in the lab, mm. hidden from anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And the uh, the thing is, is, you know, Science, scientists and the, the system that science is done in does not reward the communication or the translation of that research. It rewards people producing papers in peer reviewed journals, which like, have you read them? They're gross. Even if you like the science in there, they're a hurdle to get over. Like, oh my God. So is that, and also grant money. Those are the two things scientists are rewarded for. They're not rewarded or promoted on the basis of how well their research is communicated. I don't care about it being taken up in uh, industry. That's something that maybe we can't control. We can we can kind of help catalyze. But what they're not, yeah, what they're not rewarded for is just taking their science and disseminating it to the world. And so um, I wanted to create an easy way for them to do that. So on the web application, a scientist goes in. Uh, we've got sentence starters. Like it's so crazy. I was speaking to these scientists and like, what do you want? Like. You're clever. Mm. And they're like, yeah, just give us like sentence starters. I just want this over and done with, right? Yeah. They don't, they don't want to think about how to communicate efficiently. They just want to be led through the steps. Yeah, and it's like I'm good at science. Yeah, um, help me to communicate what I've. That's right. What I've researched and what yeah. is valuable to others. That's right. And a lot of scientists just aren't interested in the communication part, but that's becoming even more important in today's social media driven world. Look at this with all these cameras. They need yeah. to be doing this. <laughs> um, and so yeah, we lead them through the four 
really important questions of why you did your work, uh, what's new about your work, how you did that, and where is it going. So we lead them through these four kind of narrative creation steps. Uh, within about half an hour, they create a script, they talk their script aloud, and then we take that audio. And it's really, imp it's weird because people are like, why do they have to record their voice? But it's such an intimate way of consuming information. Like it brings the human element out into science. Yeah, and the voice is so authentic, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And so I've really stuck with that. Some people, it, it is our biggest hurdle to get scientists to push record, but I feel like it's the friendliest way. So they're not on camera because being on camera is a bit weird for everyone. Yes. <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, this is really important that their voice is in there because like you said, it's authentic. It humanizes science and it gives the scientists a chance to grow as well their personal brand or professional brand about what they do. So after they verbalize their script, which is where verbalize.science mm -hmm. comes from, um, then we take that script and we essentially turn it into multimedia suitable for promoting that work. So whether it be social media, whether it be on their website, YouTube or whatever it is. So we do all the heavy lifting with the multimedia stuff. And all we need from the scientists is for them to distill their their um, story down yeah. into the four separate kind of like parts. So it's bringing technology in with the science that mm. also then gives a voice Absolutely. to what they're trying to do. So are you trying to break the stereotype of science? I'd like to think so. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm deepening it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, um, yeah look, I, I, you're right. I, I think I just really want science to be seen not only as something that that results in knowledge but something that humans do yes yeah because it can be really easy to be like scientists have blah 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 and you just imagine a white dude in a white lab coat in a lab no there's so much diversity in science and we want to get their voices out there so do you know what the the, the biggest uh, demographic to use verbalize.science at the moment are women women young women scientists they're they're engaging they know that social media and promotion is an important part. And I think, yeah, that, that demographic has really taken to verbalize. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. Yeah. So when you talk about science has such a broad aspect, mm. what are you talking about? Like, what is science? Yeah. Well, yeah. What is the science? The big question of the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, look, science for me is just finding out more about the world, like accumulating evidence about the world so that we can essentially, I guess, make life better. So to me, that's the ultimate goal of science is to make people's lives and humanity's lives better. Um, we do end up with fancy offshoots with, for example, the iPhone. Yes. We, you know, we end up with the, the fancy gadgets that science has helped create. But ultimately, it's how do we make you live a happier, healthier, better life? How, how do we make the... Uh, uh, make sure we don't kill the earth? How do we make sure that we've got longevity, not only as a human race, but as individuals, all of that stuff? I think that's, yeah, that's ultimately, I think, what science should be striving for. And unfortunately, um, the way that it's rewarded at the moment is short-termism. So it's about, yeah, getting grants, getting papers out in the world. And just if I can influence the translation of that, that work into real life, into taking, uh, you know, end users of that research, if I can alert them to research earlier or alert them to research they would never, ever have heard about before, then I think that's the role that, that I want Verbalize to play. Yeah, it's cool. And it's almost like you say, you know, reading um, journals and things like that, it's like another language. And mm. so for... For us, we need we need that translated and to know about it well, to begin know, with. Yeah, and scientists need it dumb. dumb I say dumb down, they hate that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah they, scientists as well want to consume information that isn't super technical, at least for the first touch point, mm. right? The first touch point, the teaser element should be engaging. It should be easy to understand and it shouldn't have any jargon in it. That's for everyone. That's universal, yes. right? Yeah. And then you give people options from there. Scientists then can go to the paper after they've decided it's worth investing time reading this paper and going deeper, great. But for everyone else, that's enough information for them to understand what the science is about, why it's important and that sort of stuff. So yeah, this universal simple touch point is, uh, is so important. Yeah, and I know I've worked in um, the cancer sector quite a bit mm. um, when I was employed 
And I know like childhood leukemia, for instance, at one point it was a 5% survival rate. Wow. And within 20 years, it had flipped to 95%. Wow. And that's because of science. You know, it is yeah. actually driving our world. And we look, we only have to look at climate change mm. um, at the moment. You know, it's a hot topic and something mm-hmm. that we really need to be thinking about long term mm. um, as well. So it yeah. drives that. And look, if I can, if, if Verbalize can have any impact in taking research and accelerating its uptake, you know, they talk about drugs. New drugs take, let's say, 10 years to come onto market from the moment they're discovered, tested, gone through human trials. If I can accelerate that even by one year, there's so many more lives that will be impacted in that extra yeah. year that it's around. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, that's that's kind of like the overarching scheme and a, and a verbalize. Uh, and it's just dealing with the minutia now of business, which yeah. is like, that's, I lo- that's what I want verbalize to achieve. But there's so many little decisions and steps and, you know, our web application needs to get better. So we've got a human, uh, human-centered human design user interface person coming on in March to help us do that. So that's really exciting. But try not to lose uh, track or the purpose of, of Verbalize is, yeah. is the hardest thing at the moment. Yeah. So that coming back to that question mark of, you know, constantly trying to work mm. through uh, the problems and challenges and how do you make this better? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So you talk about the communication of scientists. Mm. Um, you yourself have a daily vlog on I LinkedIn. I do. And can you just tell people why you started that and how has that sort of evolved for you? Yeah, so um, I just passed the year mark on the vlog. Yes. So uh, it started a year ago. So I knew that getting your message out into the world and help genuinely helping people could only be a good thing. And I thought, what is the best way for me to do that? Because you always got to work to your strengths. I tried science writing for a bit. I'm not a writer. I'm an extroverted dude. I need to get (laughs) out. I need to speak to people. So you're not the scientist who stays in the lab? No, not at all. I know. And I was like, how do I get out? How do I get my messages? And how do I be helpful to as many people as possible? And I looked around on on social media sites and LinkedIn at the time, there were a lot of talking heads, a lot of people talking to camera. And I thought, oh, that's that seems like a reasonable way that I could do that, that I could, yeah, I could produce a vlog. So I started at first with 10. I said, I'm going to do 10 uh, vlogs. These are my rules always. I never sell. I'm not interested in selling on LinkedIn. I'm not interested in Uh, I'm interested in people, you know, finding out about me and my business, but I'm not there to do hard sales or whatever. Another thing is relentlessly helpful. Throughout this process of growing a business, throughout my uh, career as a scientist, I learned lots of things and I don't want that to go to waste. Even like I want to learn a thing today and I'm happy to share it. Like this is a discovery for me and my audience as much as it is um, me showing that I know things, you know, like. Uh, and yeah, so and having, why would you share things like that if um, it's a discovery? Or what's the point of that? If it, just sharing what I learn even that day, I think just why not? You know, like if people are so concerned about being viewed as experts that they forget that they're also discovering. And it's almost just be like, you know, yeah, I know a lot about this area and I can really help you here. But this is what I've learned today. And maybe this is this will also help you. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's that reciprocity, isn't it? Like, of, yeah. I'll give you that so something might come back to you. But also those things that you discover are transferable Mm. into other areas of your life as Mm -hmm. well. Absolutely. Mm. So, yeah, those are my rules, like no selling, relentlessly helpful. um, And I wanted it to be uh, interesting and have a narrative, simple narrative structure, right? This is what we do on Verbalize, background, problem statement, uh, solution or resolution to that problem. So it's like I try my best every day to have a narrative. I don't always do it. Yeah. But that's that was my that was my mission because I wanted to show that producing regular content with a narrative that was helpful can attract people to you. You can, you know, you can grow an audience but an audience that uh, is engaged with you and potentially then your business, but really it's just about being relentlessly helpful to as many people as possible. Yeah. And so I started with 10 days. 
And I was like, oh, this, okay, I can do 10 days. I said, oh, I'll push it to like 20. Okay, I've done 20. And I did it in a row. And I said, wow. I would do 100 days in a row. I didn't get there because I it burn out, right? Yeah. Um, and as, as the vlog has evolved, it's got more and more complicated. And so I started vlogging and it was a simple piece of camera, a couple of B-roll, like B-roll, I mean, like just my environment or what I was doing or whatever. And that was really good. And I was like, okay, that's great. And it took me about two hours to produce an edit in the evening. Then I, then I started to get quicker. So I, instead of two hours editing, I, it would take me, say, I got it down to about 40 minutes at one point. That was boring. <laughs> Uh, so I said to myself, how do I still edit for two hours? How do I use those two hours, but I increase the complexity of my vlogs? So then I would put, essentially just record more footage, put much more uh, emphasis on B-roll footage, uh, try to uh, think about the narrative much more for the next day. But also, then I bought a bloody drone. <laughs> uh, so, that, so that's the biggest thing of how it's evolved is... I've got my, my camera that I carry around everywhere with me, um, but I got, a, I got a drone and I love the drone. It adds such an awesome sort of shot variety to the vlog. And also it's a nice point of difference. I haven't seen anyone else using drone footage like that on LinkedIn. And I thought I enjoy it. My audience clearly enjoys it. Yeah. It's a great addition. Brilliant. It's worth the thousand dollars I spent on a bloody drone, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how it's evolved, and uh, I've got no reason to stop. Okay. I'm going to be continuing to do this until either I'm hated or loved. Uh, I'm hoping it's the loved one. Um, uh, but also, it's really important. So I don't film Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah, so you talked about burnout. Yeah. So it was like it became too much? It became far too much, mm. um, mainly because of the two hours editing, always having that thought at the front of your mind, like, I should capture this. I should capture that. I'll get B-roll footage of me walking down the stairs. Like, that's always just during the week. That's just always at the front of my mind. And so I don't film Fridays and Saturdays so I can just relax. Yeah. So how's that helped you with your creativity and the way the vlogs evolved by having two days off? Yeah. Creativity has increased because I can think about topics on that day off. So Saturdays is going to sound so like holistic and like I'm about to <laughs> drink kombucha, but I have a, I try to have a tech free day. I don't, so not only, yeah, cause I'm editing and I'm filming and I'm on my phone all during the week. I've got to have one day. I'm trying my best. I don't always do it, but I do, I try my best to have a tech free day. And on that day is when I'm most creative. So I'll write stuff down. I'll have thoughts and you know, your mind isn't, your mind isn't meant for storing information. It's meant for creating and connecting. Yeah. So on that day is when I write down so many topics that come into my mind. I write down uh, things that I can do to improve the vlog or people I want to speak to or yeah, all that sort of stuff. So um, those two days off have improved the vlog and I've got to protect those days at all costs. Yes. It's the hardest thing to do because I just want to create. Yeah. Even and today, like uh, Yeah, here. today is Friday and um, Andrew came in and... It's like, oh, you don't have your camera. And it's yeah. like, no, I need to create that boundary around that. And you know, this would have been great footage, but it's like, I, well, no, I need that. And that's the, that's what I, that's the kind of balance I try to play mm. is uh, there's the book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Yeah. And one of them uh, is to protect the production capacity. So production for me is, as part of pr promoting me and my businesses is the vlog. Yes. But I need to protect as much as the vlog the capacity to do that vlog well. And so I would have loved, I mean, what? how great is this? This studio with mm. the lights, this lovely gentleman here, you know, it's all brilliant. This would be fantastic footage. Mm. But if I let that slip, if I, if I, if I just bring it in today because of footage, then I feel like the production capacity component of my vlogging would be quite, or would be impacted. And that would seep into next week and next week probably wouldn't be as good or I wouldn't feel as happy with it. So, yeah, you know, it's really hard. Not After you've pushed record every weekday for a year, it's hard not to push record on a day, especially when something cool like this is happening. Yeah, yeah. But it's a great message, I think, of, 
you know, boundaries and what's your capacity and mm. how that goes. And it reminds me when you talk about having that tech free day mm. that quite often I have clients who are stressed and burnt out and everything and they just want to keep driving. And it's actually, you just need a day off yeah. um, to actually sit and ponder. And creativity does come to the surface when you've got space for it. Yeah. Because if you're driving and, you know, your mind is full, how is new stuff going to come through? Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like that day. It's, you know, like when you're in the shower and you're like, yes. oh, that thing. And you just, you know, it's like that, but without being nude and wet yeah. all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, do what you want on your Saturdays. If you yeah. want to be nude and wet all day, it's up to you. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever you like. Whatever floats your boat. Yeah. Or it's like when you're by yourself in the car, you come up mm. with all these ideas and mm -hmm. that's because you've got space for it. Yes. Um, yeah. So well done to you for doing that because it would have been very tempting to... Oh, to bring it in today, today. And, but the good yeah. thing is, this is going to be on Facebook, right? Yeah. So I'm going to rip this, uh, rip this <laughs> off. Don't you worry. <laughs> no, that's good. So you've had quite um, the experience with, and I think curiosity and that scientist and that, you know, trying to question things and mm. and find solutions to things. So what is your message for the world around all of this? <laughs> I, I really, I think, just like helping people is the number one thing like i i i when i started doing the vlogging when i created verbalize you know it was all to solve a problem it was all to help people um and i think just being like relentlessly helpful is what i always go back to is like have i been relentlessly helpful with this customer have i been relentlessly helpful trying to uh communicate whatever message i've got today um and that's really i think yeah part of Part of what drives me um and it's nice yeah it's nice that i think now after the vlogging for a year after being in the entrepreneurial scene in adelaide for a bit um the you know the people that are being uh, that are nice and you can it it, it kind of helps bring those people closer to you um and so yeah all of that so yeah being relentlessly helpful um no selling stop selling yeah. to people <laughs> uh, all of that and it's weird, but I think about this a lot, this aspect. And I actually follow a subreddit, which is pretty morbid. But I, I often think about like how, how short life is. And if you're not doing something that you enjoy, that helps other people, in my case, um, then I, even walking here, I parked my car uh, and... I looked across and there were people in offices and the, and just like it was a little nightmare, little nightmare box in little nightmare cubes. Mm. And uh, look, I'm incredibly privileged to be able to quit a job and then follow a, what I want to do. Um, and I think people just need to find out what makes them happy. For me, it's being helpful, being relentlessly helpful, uh, chasing curiosity and asking questions and um, yeah, that is another thing that is incredibly morbid is remembering that I will die. Yeah, we all, we all are we, dying. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But making sure that um, I in, you know, while I'm here is I do my best to, to serve my purpose and, and do what I enjoy. And hopefully, yeah, that makes everyone around me and my audience, wherever I am, uh, you know, happier and better. Yeah, I think you're doing an amazing job, Andy, at, at it's refreshing, actually, to see oh, how you. science and this authenticity and getting your message out there, but also ultimately giving your gift to the world um, is a brilliant thing. So yeah, I think you. you're really leading that and it's um, kudos to you, I think. Thank you. I, yeah. I think I one thing I like about what LinkedIn has done is I, I've really noticed a shift from talking head videos to something like something else like people sharing fit stories and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I, I'm pleased I'm part of that. Yeah, it's good. Um, so is there one final message that you would say to people? Um... Uh, one final message I would say is make sure you have fun. Yes. <laughs> that's one thing I try to bring to everything is don't take it too seriously. Even business, I'm. it's just like people feel like they should put on this persona, this LinkedIn persona with their tie and like, oh, I'm so professional and awesome. <laughs> yeah, you are, but you're also a person. Have yeah. fun, enjoy it, enjoy the process, fall in love with processes. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that would be my, my number one message is try to find the fun in everything, have fun, don't take life too seriously. Yeah, that sounds like a really 
great message that we all should take on. Thank you for joining us today. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. For show notes and more information about my guests, and to get in touch with me, visit igniteouttherapies.com.au.